NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. I'm so honored to be the moderator for this session, and I'm really excited to hear from today's speakers. Before we get started, uh, I'm going to take just three minutes to provide a little context. And to do that, I'm going to use these slides. If you attended uh, the previous sessions, this will be familiar, but shorter. So context for today's uh, discussion is the stages of the jury selection process. So here's a quick overview of those stages. First, there are non-public or invisible stages of jury selection. So these are decisions um, and actions taken by the jury commissioner or the jury clerk at the behest of the chief judge or committee of judges. And these non-public stages, they don't occur in the same order in every jurisdiction, but they always include uh, the selection of lists from agencies to use as a source for juror names. So for example, a jurisdiction might take the list of registered voters, the list of taxpayers, combine them, and use that as the source for juror names. And as the speakers on Tuesday pointed out, that this step can introduce racial and ethnic disparity in the jury system if the jurisdiction doesn't select lists that actually re re represent the community. There's also a stage where the jury office removes people from the source list who don't meet the eligibility criteria set by statute for jury service. And in yesterday's session, we talked about, we learned about what we lose when those eligibility criteria exclude people with a felony conviction or um, people with limited English proficiency. Next, using this smaller subset of people deemed qualified to serve as jurors, the jury office summons jurors by mailing them a notice to whatever address they have on file. And at the next stage, the jury office um, processes the response or lack of response that they got from those mailings. And those responses include requests to be excused, um, often on the grounds that jury service imposes too big of a financial burden. Sometimes it's just a request to defer the date of service. Some people don't respond, and there's always some portion of those jury forms that are returned by the Postal Service as undeliverable because um, it was a bad or inaccurate address. And as the Tuesday speakers pointed out, these, these uh, the undeliverables and the non-responses are both responsible for introducing a great deal of disparity and their factors over which courts can exercise some control. For example, by making different policy decisions like updating the addresses on the source list more often. These non-public or invisible stages of jury selection produce a group of people who arrive at the courthouse on a given day ready to go through the voir dire process. And it's now that the more public stages, the visible stages of jury selection occur in that they happen in the courtroom in view of the lawyers and the judges and the parties as a part of the voir dire process. And this voir dire process includes a stage where jurors are removed for cause which uh, this is where one of the lawyers argues that the potential juror cannot be fair. The judge agrees and the judge excludes the juror. And at the final stage, and the focus of today's conversation, um, is when jurors are removed through peremptory strikes. So this is where lawyers decide to exclude a juror ostensibly on the grounds that they won't be a good juror for their case. And only after all these stages of jury selection are completed do we end up with the actual trial jury who will decide the case. So again, it's that final stage, the peremptory strikes, maybe the sort of voir dire process in general, the public aspects of jury selection that are the focus of today's discussion. So let us turn to that discussion now. So on paper, we have a rule that although attorneys have the right to remove potential jurors by exercising peremptory strikes, attorneys are not permitted to remove any jurors on the basis of race or ethnicity. And we have this 1986 Supreme Court decision in Batson um, that lays out a test for determining when a attorney has violated that rule and exercised a strike on the basis of race or ethnicity. And yet there is pervasive evidence um, that prosecutors disproportionately use those peremptory strikes to remove jurors of color. And so the question I'd like to ask each of you is why isn't Batson working? And if I may, Professor Rankin, would you start us off? 
Yes, no, I, I thank you so much, Professor Turnoff. That was a fantastic introduction. Also, thank you to the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers for having us and for all of you for attending and, and enriching all of this conversation at a, a national scale. With As you ask this question, you know, why isn't the Batson test working? I'd like to share with a little bit of an overview of the history of jury selection as it relates in particular with race in particular. So prior, prior to the Civil War, and we'll, you always get a little worried when someone says, let's go back into the Civil War, but I think it helps us understand our context. Prior to the Civil War, jury selection of the United States, jury service in particular was largely um, restricted to white men in the United States. And it won't be until we get the 14th Amendment that's going to give citizenship to um, natural born Americans, in particular Black Americans, that we're going to see citizenship open up as it relates to men and the opportunity to serve on juries. The Civil Rights Act of 1875, shortly thereafter, will include a provision that will actually outlaw race-based discrimination in jury service. And in 1880, we're already going to see this put to the test with the U.S. Supreme Court of Strouder versus West Virginia that's going to strike down a statute that was explicitly restricting jury service to white Americans. But this progress is going to be pretty short-lived. Um, we're going to see across the nation that though the statutes will be removed from the books, the practice of all white juries throughout the United States will stay in practice. Um, all the way from the later um, 19th century to early 20th century. And connecting this with widespread lynchings throughout the, um, the South as it relates to Black Americans and many others, we're going to see that even in largely Black counties, we're still going to end up with all white juries. And it won't be until 1935, if you've ever heard of the Scottsboro Boys, um, the case known as, uh, that is Norris versus Alabama, um, where we're going to get the Supreme Court back looking at this notion of Blacks that have been excluded from juries and serving in juries. And, and then again, in 1945, though, the court is going to uphold a Texas County token policy, where as long, even if there's just one Black juror, you're A-OK. -okay. By the 60s and 70s, the United States is going to move to this kind of, here we go, as long as there's a, a fair cross-section of the community in the in the um, veneer process, you'll be okay. So we're gonna move farther away in terms of scope of who can be in there as long as the person's allowed for the opportunity to serve on a jury or there, it's okay. When we get though to jury pool, that will be the focus and we're going to keep narrowing down. And by 1965, the Supreme Court is going to go to Swain versus Alabama. And here in this case, the prosecutors have used a peremptory strike to exclude all six black members of the jury pool. Um, it was going to take about 20 years before we're going to have any defendant um, ever prevail on a Swain claim. And that takes us to 1986, the Batson versus K Kentucky, um, that's going to create this different burden that we're going to look at, this lower burden. That's where we are today. Um, I thank you for your allowing me to go down memory lane on that because it becomes this two steps for, you know, every one step forward, two steps back that we're going to run into. There's going to be continual ups and downs as it relates to how do we ensure that there is a true representation of the community on a jury. And it doesn't matter what rules and issues are put in place, there will be so many efforts related to move away from explicit language that persons will use that might sound race related to euphemisms. Uh, I consider it, the reason I would say that the Batson test isn't working is that we are stuck in this strange place of a game of taboo. How do you talk about race without using the word race? And that's what's happening in our courtrooms today. So that's kind of what I would argue um, of why the Batson test doesn't actually work is because we're waiting for a particular set of terms to be used in a particular order. And that um, there's been some savviness by attorneys to work around that. Thank you. It's so critical to start with this, the context, the historical context. Uh, Professor Bright, your thoughts? Well, I think the reason it doesn't work is because it requires proof of intentional race discrimination. And we know in all sorts of contexts that it's very, very hard. The law makes it very hard to prove intentional race discrimination because it's very hard to know what someone's intent or someone's motive is. And the other thing, I think it's just psychological. Uh, Batson uh, challenged 
uh, asks a judge uh, to say that a lawyer intentionally discriminated on the basis of race and then lied about it uh, by giving a reason that was not the actual reason for the strike, but was a pretextual reason. And many of the judges, uh, particularly in the state courts, where the judges overwhelmingly are elected, uh, many of those judges made their way to the bench by being prosecutors. Uh, many of them struck all the uh, African Americans uh, when they selected juries. Uh, now they're on the bench. Maybe the person who was their chief assistant is now the new district attorney. Uh, and so they're called upon to say uh, that that person discriminated in, in striking uh, people of color and then didn't tell the truth about it. Uh, but even if there's not that kind of close relationship or that kind of history, I think just it's very hard uh, for one lawyer to look at another lawyer. I think everybody knows the reason is race when, when some uh, person strikes five out of five or eight out of eight or all the uh, African-Americans or people of color in, in the jury veneer, uh, it's pretty clear what's going on uh, and the reasons that are offered are like, you know, I didn't like the juror's haircut or something like that. Uh, but it's one thing to sort of recognize that it's a whole nother thing to say uh, I find that you intentionally discriminated uh, and that you didn't tell the truth when you gave your reasons. And I just think it's very, I just think Batson will never work. It's the re also the reason that Justice Marshall pointed out in his concurring opinion in Batson, uh, this does not deal with unconscious racism. It only deals with intentional race discrimination. As he said, then any prosecutor is gonna be able to come up with reasons. Anybody that graduated from law school surely can come up with a reason or two. And particularly since the courts uphold very trivial reasons, uh, it, it's just not gonna work and it doesn't work. And I think a lot of courts like the Washington uh, Supreme Court and others, and many of the people commentators who've written about that have recognized that, that it just simply does not work and it's not going to work. Thank you. Attorney Woods, why isn't it working? Sure, so um, <laughs> I wanna first off say thank you again for uh, this panel and having us here when it comes to diversity on juries. It's a problem that's near and dear to my heart and something I've been advocating for for a long time. So thank you for this discussion. So the question, uh, why isn't Batson working? Um, a kind of a short answer. The criminal legal system was built on white supremacy and systemic racism. That's it. That is foundation. That's what it is at its core. And I think it's going to take a lot more in this one well-intended Supreme Court case to undo that, especially when we consider, as what's been discussed earlier, the long history of racism and intentional and deliberate exclusion of Black people and people of color from juries that was allowed in this country, um, encouraged and supported. Uh, that that's kind of the, what we're thinking about and working with here. Uh, just think about 150 years ago, the idea of having a Black person on a jury was ludicrous, right? It, it wasn't a thing. Um, so what we are trying to do is really destroy the foundations of a system. Um, we're trying to insert fairness into a system that is designed to be unfair. So it's a very, very radical proposition we're doing here and it's pretty scary. Uh, so as you've heard Batson, albeit a good case, it did not go far enough. And as um, Steve said, one of the biggest problems is the first step. You know, the very first step, that's what it's flawed as the first step. The person challenging the use of the peremptory must establish a prima facie case of purposeful discrimination in the exercise of the strike. And that is just that very first step is so hard to overcome in and of itself. Um, and then the person who uses the peremptory can give any sort of facially neutral reason for exercising that challenge. And as you've heard, any reason will suffice, almost any reason. And the judge who's going to be making that decision is likely a former prosecutor, a likely white, likely shared off to that same DA about a year ago, and likely made those same arguments to keep black people from serving as juries. And then they're going to decide the credibility of that challenge. It just doesn't work. Uh, you know, when I was practicing, I still practice, but when I actually tried cases, uh, I was trying a case where um, the DA excluded or challenged like my second black jury, juror who made it to the box. And I made my bats and my, made my objection, talked about how he's now excluded 50% of Black people who could serve as jurors in this case. And the reason he gave for excluding that juror was because she was wearing a puppy coat. A, a, a puppy coat. 
And if that would have been a scene from a movie or um, in a sitcom, they would be like, no, he didn't. No, yes, he did. That was his reason. And, and what's even crazier about it is the judge accepted that reason. The judge accepted that reason. And so we, we talk about Batson. Um, yes, it is a tool, but it is also a tool that is inherently flawed. We're going to move later to talking about um, maybe some possible solutions or reforms, but one of the points that's been highlighted by the comments is that we're dealing with both explicit racism and implicit bias in this context. Um, and if I might turn back to you, Mr. Woods, can you just talk a little bit about how both of those are in play? Sure. So I think there are prosecutors out there um, more than will admit this publicly that simply do not want black people or people of color to be on their jurors. And it's just because they are black, because they're people of color. They have their own explicit racist bias. And I think when we think about where we've been uh, over the last four years with the Trump presidency, uh, it has allowed or empowered those prosecutors that people be more vocal about their bias or explicit. And the problem also is that there are judges who feel the same way and they tend to agree with them. So. Um, Implicit bias or explicit bias, the, the fact of the matter is prosecutors want to win, right? And that desire to win often overrides any desire to see justice or any desire to see fairness in the system. So instead of relying on the strength of the evidence of their case, instead of saying that I have the burden of proof and I can meet that burden of proof in front of any sort of reasonable, fair, diverse jury that you put in front of me, um, their implicit and explicit bias kicks in. So automatically, a person of color, especially a black person uh, that is not tied to law enforcement, will be seen as someone who will relate to the person accused of the crime. They'll be as someone seen as someone who will actually elevate the burden of proof for that prosecutor. And what they really are doing, um, they're not elevating it, they're just holding the prosecutor to the burden of proof as it is required by law. Um, you know, prosecutors, you know, they've had it easy. They don't like to work. They don't want to work. And so they would prefer jurors who lower that burden. The average juror, when they walk into a courtroom, you know, they've already drawn a conclusion about that case. They've already started to judge our clients. They've already started to have some sort of preconceived notion about what has happened in that case. They've already started to lower that burden of proof, whether it be because they have their biases from media or television or from propaganda. Copaganda, copaganda done a very good job of that. But um, the burden for the average juror begins to come down. And as people of color, start to share their life experiences through the voir dire process, um, their experiences are usually very, very different than a typical prosecutor. And through no fault of that particular juror, their life experience as a person of color, as a black person in America, is going to be used against them to keep them from serving as a juror. Now, that's a fact. Um, whether it be their views of police, whether it be that their family is involved in the system or arrested or prosecuted, um, whether they've been from an underserved community, those are all biases that will be used against them as far as serving as jurors. So uh, even though I said earlier, Batson is not perfect, I think we as defense attorneys, if I had to give you any advice, have to use Batson. We have to use it often, quickly, um, frequently. You know, I, I Batson very quickly when I'm trying a case. I think it's important to let the prosecutor know and the judge know that you are paying attention. If they're being racist, you're going to call them out for it. Uh, I think our clients depend on us to do it. So, I know I gave a long answer there, but yes. Oh, we want your long answer. Um, we want the full, the full piece. Um, Professor Rankin, just also looking at this issue of implicit bias and explicit racism, I know that you have um, been following what's happening in the strict state courts around implicit bias. So could you share some of those insights with us? Sure, I'd love to. And, you know, I just wanted to also add, if it's okay to also have this professor turn off, uh, Mr. Woods raised some really important points about how easy it is to, to do this. I mean, I hate to say this, but you could do a basic Google search and say, how do I get around and give racial, how do I get a black person off my jury? I'm not even asking you to do a deep Google search. Literally, there's YouTube videos on how to get black people off of your juries. Um, in fact, attorney Jack McMah McMahon um, actually has a video that you can see on YouTube. I hate to actually post, point people directly towards it, but where there are at least four instances in this person's presentation on YouTube where he is expressing exactly the language, what you wanna look out for in a black person. Almost even the fact of a person you think might be black, but you can't even really tell. 
here's the kind of language and things you look for. Um, there's something really deep that Mr. Woods raised as it relates to this puffy coat, right? Um, it's getting ready to be winter across most of the nation. And even though I live here in the Southwest, even we know what puffy coats are. And, and we're talking about where does this come from? Talk with my son and explain to him New York City culture and puffy coats and Timberlands. And I'm giving him an image of where it comes from. And that image is not just known by me, it's known by our jurors, it's known by people who turn on TV or social media, that puffy coats are the equivalent of saying black people, right? And so when you don't have to say the word black people, you can just pull from this notion of puffy coat, hoop earrings, whatever else it might be to get us to that same outcome. Now, Professor Turnoff, you asked about, um, you asked about what's happening in state courts. And I wanted to also just say a little bit more background. Um, our, our, our viewers might be interested in a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's by Daniel Kahneman. It's a really well-known book in the world of economics, but he goes into this thing called the halo effect. Mr. Woods had also mentioned this, right? This notion that we're looking for that first confirmation of what we're already expecting. And our jurors who are walking in have already come to this idea that if you have been gotten to the place in the legal system where you are sitting in the defendant's chair, there's some reason that it is confirmation of something deeper. We won't even go into the over-policing of certain communities. We won't even go into the fact that you could turn on the news at one point and watch a pot party on the beach in California while you could see people being beaten up for possession of, of marijuana in New York City. We won't even go into that. People have this idea that if you're in that defendant seat, there's a reason why. And, um, and so when you think about what's happening all across the nation, this isn't a Southern thing, this isn't a big city thing, this is across the country. So for instance, um, one instance that has occurred is in Pennsylvania, um, where there was a judge who's recently uh, been removed from the bench. Um, this was in 2013, um, Judge Tranquilly in the, in the Allegheny County District, um, Allegheny County referred to a black female juror as Aunt Jemima during meetings in chambers with attorneys in, um, on the case. The woman had been, it was a woman, black woman in her 20s who was wearing a kerchief or a wrap on her head and he couldn't call a name. He called her Aunt Jemima in, in the background of, uh, in the um, private chambers. In California, just in September of this year, um, a case has just gone forward with an appeals court for a case out of Contra, um, where a Contra Costa prosecutor had dismissed a black woman from the jury pool uh, um, because she had attended a Black Lives Matter rally. And that was enough of a, a pretext. And the um, Court of Appeals has overturned that, um, that arguing that her removal of the jury was inappropriate. Similarly, in South North Carolina, once again, uh, this is just in October of 2021, they're already in the process now of hearing oral arguments for Black jurors who have been removed for also attending Black Lives Matter rallies. Um, I just want to uh, give an aside. You should know that the Black Lives Matter protests that happened internationally in every single county in this nation had people of every single racial group. So there's something a lot deeper to analyze as it relates to Black jurors. So but your likelihood of having jury members or potential members of the jury who were non-Black that attended Black Lives Matter rallies, not being distinct in that same way is something to, to really keep in mind. Um, our, the last court that I'm kind of watching and that I encourage you all to watch is out of Colorado. The Colorado Supreme Court um, just is uh, weighing in on the role of a Latino juror's dismissal. And this is of September of 2021. The Colorado Supreme Court is looking at this. This one is really interesting. I encourage you to, to dive in and, and check a little bit more deeply into the actual um, transcripts because what they are uh, I'm pulling out the um, assistant attorney working in this case tried to argue that it wasn't uh, motivated by race. Um, but what's really important to me is that um, there's some language that, that the attorney general argued is that people were just speaking in a clumsy manner. That when they express things that you or I might say, you know, that sounds pretty racist. No, no, they just didn't know the words. That's just what came out, but it's not their intent going back to what Professor Bright raised, which is on this idea of intent, that even when it is written in the records, it can be read plainly word by word, arguments come, well, that's what they said, but that's not what they really meant. And so how do we actually determine intent? What does intent have to look like? What does, when does 
um, that someone were waiting for this moment for a prosecutor to come out and say, just to be very clear, I'm going to be using race right now. Off we go. That's not going to happen. As Professor Bright said, hopefully they're getting well trained in our law schools to be able to know how to raise arguments. And so those are some of the things happening in our courts. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bright, is there, do you have any reflections on the dual existence of implicit bias and explicit racism in this context? Well, I would just add one word on implicit bias. I think when it comes to grappling uh, with issues in the criminal courts, I think black people see one uh, reality and white people see another, uh, often looking at the same thing. And there's no question, we talked a minute ago about uh, you know, explicit people who have racist attitudes or whatever. I think the thing where Batson fails so much is that there, there there's some people who see themselves as being very fair uh, and, and not particularly racist, but who, uh, because of uh, attitudes they have, don't realize really uh, how racially based they are. They probably haven't taken the implicit bias test. Uh, and we haven't really seen the fact that uh, they associate, uh, just like the example given a moment ago, when you ask jurors uh, if they've been involved in Black Lives Matter, uh, do they not trust the police? Uh, other kinds of questions like that, and uh, jury, the prosecutor will say, well, that person can't be fair, uh, but very often that's really a proxy for race uh, in terms of uh, how uh, the person feels. And, and of course, when uh, prosecutors exclude people because of those reasons, particularly in many cases, not every case, because there are certainly uh, many jurisdictions in the country, a majority uh, black jurisdictions, but in, in the ones where you have only five, six, seven, eight uh, people of color in the jury veneer while you're picking the jury, uh, if a number of those are excluded uh, because of reasons like that, because they don't trust the police, because they don't believe in the death penalty, uh, because they've been involved in Black Lives Matter, uh, you're not going to have hardly any people left, uh, and then it's going to be easy for the prosecutor to strike those people with a with a peremptory strike, and and maybe uh, even if the judge doesn't exclude the people because those reasons, those will be the reasons given uh, for uh, the peremptory strikes. Uh, so again, Justice Marshall predicted this, uh, and I think his predictions ha have come true. Uh, over and over again uh, since 35 years ago we made them. I think the chat alone demonstrates um, the problem with the test. People are including examples of rationales that were upheld for the strike of jurors of color. It's a pretty um, dire list. So um, obviously one response that we hear to this problem of bats and not working, the problem of peremptory strikes being used to remove people of color is to eliminate peremptory strikes. And so I'd like to ask each of you what you think of that proposal and why it is or isn't a good uh, response. Attorney Woods, you're smiling. I, I wanna hear what you're saying. Sure, sure. I, I, I will jump in. I, I think we've maybe touched on this a little bit. Um, I think there are other options that can be done prior to eliminating peremptory challenges. I, I think Batson has his issues, so why not fix it? I think what they've done in Washington with GR37 um, is a great model. I think what we've done here in California with AB 37 that even hasn't gone into effect yet, goes into January, um, is also a good model. And what I mean by that for people who are aware or not aware, they get rid of that first step of Batson. Um, there's an objection that's made, um, goes to a reasonable person category, and then beyond that, it lays out all of these reasons that prosecutors give that are now presumptively invalid. And so what we've talked about um, when it comes to um, distrust of law enforcement or um, belief that police engage in racial profiling or a jury's neighborhood or having close contact with people who are arrested or stopped by police, dress and attire, um, receiving state benefits, all, all those reasons that prosecutors have been using since Batson's come out to remove black people from juries. I keep people on black people, I'm black, that's my focus, sorry. Um, but um, those reasons are presumptively invalid. And if the DA gives some sort of reason why they exclude that black person, it's gotta be clear and convincing evidence that it wasn't based on race. So it's like, I mean, th that is like mind blowing right there. Um, yes, it's still decided by a judge, but it does give us a lot of action and track in regards to keeping our juries of color. Going back to um, the removal of peremptory challenges altogether, but my biggest problem with that is because then you're going to put it in the hands of judges solely 
to decide cause challenges. Um, there are going to be judges that we've said who were former prosecutors who are going to be deciding who is composed, who the jury is composed of. And um, that is not a risk I'm willing to take. Uh, I, I don't I don't trust them to do, get it right. I think they will um, lean towards prosecutors in their decisions and it will probably be worse for us. Um, I think I have one more thought on that. And, and if we want to get into um, a real way to make it fair, um, a real way to really get that fair juror, um, there's a thought that peremptory should be in balance, right? Maybe more for the defense, less for the prosecutors, maybe none for the prosecutors. Those are other thoughts that are outside the box. And finally, to close that loop, I think it's important, um, really, really important to allow our clients to have some sort of say um, with regards to challenging who's on the jury. Um, I think it's critically important. It's their lives. They're the ones who are going to either be acquitted or have to serve time. Giving them some sort of decision-making process to who serves as a juror is critically important. And there are times when I've gotten it wrong in my analysis. So I'm like, I got to kick that person. It's kind of like, don't kick them. And they've been 100% right or the other way around. So I think giving them that voice in the process is really, really important. So those are my reasons. That just reminds me, I'm sure everyone has heard this great podcast and information, but the Batson case itself was at the initiative of the client who said that black jurors are being removed and the attorney said something like, well, that's not a claim. And the client said, well, it should be. And now it is. So that's uh, undergirds your point. Professor Bright, what are your thoughts about that proposal of eliminating peremptory strikes? Sure. Well, of course, Arizona is going to do that starting January 1st. So tune in. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, in Arizona. Uh, I share the concern uh, that if you do away with peremptory strikes altogether, uh, that means whatever the judge decides on strikes for cause, that's the end of the day, and you're not going to, uh, there's not going to be any opportunity for either side uh, for that juror that they just think no way, just based on body language, based on uh, all sorts of things, cannot be fair. Um, of course, we see this occasionally with Batson. There was a, a federal case of a very prominent politician uh, in Georgia, an African-American who was prosecuted and the federal judge in that case, uh, denied all the challenges that the defense made uh, of the prosecution strike of African-Americans. But then the judge granted Batson challenges with regard to the defense strikes of white uh, challenge to the prosecution strike of white jurors. My goodness. I mean, I think the judge seated uh, three people that the defense uh, tried to strike. So it shows you the, the danger there. I see a lot of cases out of Alabama and the system there uh, gives people a lot of peremptory strikes, sometimes as many as 20 in a case or more. Well, when you have that many strikes, uh, you're going to be able to eliminate probably all the uh, people of color in the veneer, even if you're in communities that have a very substantial uh, population of people of color. Uh, my view about it is we'd be better off to reduce the number of peremptory strikes. In Virginia, uh, each side has only four. Uh, you can't do a huge amount of damage in terms of excluding uh, people on the basis of race with just four strikes, but you can uh, strike the people that you just think, no way is that person ever uh, going to be able to be fair to my client. Um, I don't see politically uh, that we're ever going to see a day when uh, the government's uh, cut back on prosecution strikes, but not defense strikes. It used to be that way in Georgia, where I practiced for many years. The defense had twice as many strikes as the prosecution, 20 to 10 in, in capital cases. Uh, but the prosecutors went to the legislature and changed that. Um, there's still a few places where there's a difference, but uh, politically, I think that's, that's hard to imagine that legislatures, most places are going to do that. I was going to, um, my colleagues are geniuses, so I trust them completely on this. Um, when I think about this, this question you just asked, Professor Turnoff, I, I guess I, I find myself pausing on something Professor, I mean, Mr. Woods has said pretty early on, I'll call him Professor because he's been speaking, dropping lots of knowledge today. But Mr. Woods had mentioned something very early, right? If you were to go back and say, 
what is the purpose of our legal system in the United States? What is the purpose of the Constitution? What is the purpose of these processes and systems that we have? And I'm a computer scientist by training, so I tend to think of what was the intended outcome of the code of our legal system? And the purpose, the intended outcome of our legal system is for certain populations to benefit and others to deal with the burden of it. Some call this white supremacy. Some call this, our, in some of our studies of critical race theory, this is all under this idea that the system is designed for the same outcome, no matter what tweaks and changes you put along the way. That's a really negative way to think about it, but it's, it's a, a reality that many people aren't willing to dive in and say explicitly that there is an outcome that this code or rules or laws are supposed to get to. And that's what I would start thinking about with this peremptory challenges, right? Every time there's a new tweak change put on top of something, my, my first go-to would be, where did this come from? Who first proposed it and what was this intention? Um, thank you, Professor Bright is absolutely right about what's happening in Arizona. And what I find really interesting is to study and look at this, uh, they're amending rules 18.4 and 18.5, the rules of the criminal procedure of, of Arizona. And what's really I found interesting was to actually read through the public comments that people attached when they proposed this rule, right? To watch uh, the feedback from practitioners um, of what they said this would do or not do in criminal defense with, with the prosecutors. And, and I saw a great comment in our chat, right, where a colleague from Arizona, thank I love our insight from, from all these international perspectives, I mean, I'm sorry, all the different jurisdictional perspectives, um, that this was really proposed and, and motivated by uh, the, the defense bar who really sees this as an area that could hopefully affect change. Unfortunately, I feel like we're gonna, it's gonna be one of those wait and sees right, on whether or not this is a best practice to model and see, and we'll have to watch um, what's happening in Arizona for eh, hopefully not a whole generation, but at least 10 years to get some good data to look at. Well, the other place to watch in terms of what's happening, of course, is in Washington and California, which is gonna uh, take this objective approach to bats and challenges, not asking was there intentional race discrimination, but would an objective person knowing all the circumstances think that race was a factor uh, in the strike? Uh, and uh, just based on the early returns, it looks like uh, that's a much more effective way uh, of challenging uh, peremptory strikes. Uh, so we'll see what happens, but that's been underway in Washington for some time. It'll start in California. Uh, in January, uh, I think getting intent out of it, getting it into a, an objective uh, standard is a, is a much better uh, way to deal with it. It is, as I mentioned a moment ago, though, you're still giving the trial judges a tremendous amount of power uh, over this. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if they're going to be peremptory strikes, and particularly if there's going to be a lot of peremptory strikes, uh, then uh, there has to be a way to judge uh, when there's a pattern uh, like this. The other thing that Washington did was adopt a bright line rule that anytime there's any strike, it doesn't have to be a lot of strikes, but anytime there's a strike uh, of a person of color, uh, then there's a Batson inquiry with regard to it. And um, so I, I, I think uh, the one thing it's hard to measure with that is to what extent it sort of uh, makes lawyers uh, less likely to use their strikes because they know they're going to be challenged and they know the challenge may be sustained. Yeah, it seems that the legislative approaches to creating an objective test are probably the most direct route. I was also thinking there was a New Jersey decision recently where the court found that the prosecutor's uh, investigation of the criminal background of one of the would-be jurors, a black juror, was motivated by implicit bias. So without a rule on the books, the court still said, we're looking at this objectively. We don't even think you knew that's what was motivating you, but that was a problem. So that was an interesting. So I on New Jersey as well. Um, one of the points that's being made in the chat is that reducing the number of strikes could be effective in a jurisdiction that had a more diverse pool and less effective when there's only a few people of color in the pool. And so one of my questions, I know we're focused on Batson today, but um, you know, we've been talking the past two sessions about the earlier stages of jury selection, how they can reduce diversity. And I was just wondering if any of you um, had a, thoughts about, a thought about reform that we might need at any of those earlier stages to bring in a more representative group of people to go through the body process. 
where there are a lot of things can be done to make it more representative. But the one uh, thing that you can't change is if you're in a jurisdiction that doesn't have any people of color, uh, the jury is not going to reflect that. I mean, we have a lot of, and particularly in some of these states like Georgia, which has 159 counties, uh, there are all these very small counties. Many of them are white flight suburban communities, uh, and there are no uh, people of color. Uh, so uh, they're not going to be in the jury pool and they're not going to be in the jury veneer, not because of any discrimination or not because of the way in which the uh, summonses were served or excuses were allowed, uh, but because they're not there to begin with. So, I mean, one thing I would, I would like to see is a, a larger, uh, you know, the choosing uh, jurors by judicial districts or some other multi-county way, uh, but I don't see much movement in that direction. I do think uh, the way in which people, uh, the way summons are uh, delivered and the uh, response uh, is the way in which we're losing a lot of people and a lot of diversity in the jury veneers. I, um, I have a horrible joke, but you know, I live in New Mexico, right, where the population is 2.3% Black, but the criminal defendants are about 6%. If they could find all these people to put on trial, they can find some Black people to put on the jury, right? So I, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying, Professor Bright. Um, I do live in a place that is called a majority minority community. There's lots of different types of people. Um, in New Mexico, we've tried to do some unique things in terms of selecting more individuals that have historically not been included, right? So it's not, and, and that was a great chart uh, Professor Chernoff showed at the beginning related to how parties are drawn from tax records or from um, or from voter registration, but they go farther in, in New Mexico, for instance, to get others who historically have not necessarily done all kinds of those kind of paperwork. So they'll pull from people that are receiving um, social, so, social or state support in some ways. They'll pull from people that have some kind of state ID. They'll pull from different types of records that have historically not been selected. But I do wonder, um, if they can find all of these defendants, they can find some jurors. Um, and, and one wonderful possibility that could better be used would be some community education, right? Going into historically um, underrepresented populations, even in low minority count communities and saying, it is essential that you are registered to vote because that's the way it works in our county. Or it's essential that we lobby that they expand who gets selected for the um, veneer process. It is essential that we get more of our names in the pool. Um, but yeah, the, I, that really does stand out to me what Professor Bright said about low count number communities. Yeah, I, I think you've covered a lot of it, um, this amount of discussion now, and what's been what you discussed over the last couple of days in the um, seminar. You know, a, a big one, of course, is eliminating the felony exclusion. Um, you know, in California, over 30% of black men were prevented from serving as jurors because of felony exclusionary rules. And that's just insane. So we're the most over prosecuted, over policed, but the least represented on juries. Um, and the rule was such that any felony conviction, no matter how old it was, um, would prevent you from serving, which is absolutely crazy and insane. Um, and, and as we've discussed, also expanding the list, that, that's something that needs to be done. Um, you know, California just says DMV um, tax file, I'm sorry, DMV and voter, we added tax files this year, but there's so many more to be added, whether it be Board of Administration, Healthcare Insurance, um, Census, Utility Bills, uh, Safety Net, um, it, it wouldn't be creative, let's, let's add Facebook users, right? I mean, you would get more jurors than ever, let's put a Facebook to some good, right? <laughs> um, um, and, and I think um, a, a big thing that we haven't discussed yet um, which is starting a pilot program in San Francisco recently is um, paying jurors, right? P paying them a real wage, um, making jury service be the equivalent of the minimum wage for that state, you know, pay them hourly, because so many people of color are excluded for hardships. I mean, we had a juror excluded, I think it was two weeks ago, because they could not afford to take BART to come to serve as a juror. Like, oh my God, okay. Um, so uh, those are some steps that we need to take. If we're really serious about creating juries that are diverse, um, we sure as hell can afford to pay. We spend $8 billion on incarceration, right? I mean, $8 billion. Uh, it should be easy to pay people to serve as jurors. Those are great points, all of you, thank you. 
So I have a question for Professor Bright, because if we look at your record before the Supreme Court, uh, we might feel very optimistic about judicial review of Batson, because most recently you've argued two cases uh, where a Supreme Court reversed convictions on the ground that the prosecutor had struck jurors because they were black. And so um, are these, <laughs> I mean, are these representative cases or what, what do they tell us about the rest of Batson case law? Well, unfortunately, I think both one of the cases that I argued, Tim Foster versus Chapman, uh, as well as the Curtis Flowers case, which was decided most recently out of Mississippi, as well as the Millerell case out of Texas, uh, all those cases are extraordinary cases. Uh, in Tim Foster's case, we found records in the district attorney's files, which we got under the Open Records Act, which didn't leave any question. Uh, that the strikes were motivated by race. I mean, everything in the way they had uh, written the jurors down, B1, B2, and B2, three for the blacks, the memo in the file that said, uh, if we have to choose a black, maybe we'll choose this juror. The closing argument that you had to give Foster the death penalty to send a message to the people in the projects, which were 90% uh, African-American. Of course, Flowers had six capital trials the prosecution struck blacks as many as they could in every one of those one of those trials. Not many people have uh, six capital trials. And Millerell, the uh, evidence from uh, Dallas uh, of a manual that told the prosecutors to strike, and then the numbers in the case. So all those cases are cases that I think the Supreme Court can, uh, you know, sort of hold up and say, "Well, we're uh, we're against race discrimination." The problem is almost any other case, you say, well, yeah, this is not as extraordinary as any one of those three cases. The one case that I do think is pretty helpful is the other case I had, which was Snyder versus Louisiana. There were some extraordinary things in that case, but they didn't make it into the opinion, which is good, uh, because Snyder uh, is a case basically of a prosecutor striking five, all five of the African-Americans in the jury veneer, uh, giving reasons. Uh, and many of those reasons applied just as well uh, to white people who were accepted. Uh, the thing I would say in this session that's really important uh, is that a lot of courts are saying, if you're gonna make those comparisons and if you're gonna argue them later, you better argue them to the trial court. That didn't happen in Snyder. Uh, they hadn't even been argued to the Louisiana Supreme Court. And yet the Supreme Court of the United States in an opinion by Justice Alito uh, still looked at those comparisons uh, and said that the strikes were motivated in substantial part by racial discrimination. Despite that, some of the lower courts, I think it just are not following uh, these cases, uh, but preservation, as we all know, is critical and courts always love to duck issues by saying they weren't properly preserved. Uh, so uh, it's very important. The other thing I would just say very quickly about Batson, uh, and I would urge people to think about doing their jurisdiction, which is start keeping statistics on the prosecutor's use of strikes. Uh, there are not that many cases that go to trial anymore. It's not that hard to do. Every study that's been done of prosecution use of peremptory strikes has shown that they're overwhelmingly and disproportionately against people of color, usually black people in the studies that have been done. In North Carolina, every single capital case. Uh, in Philadelphia, uh, in other places. So uh, if you, because a Batson challenge is not limited to just the strikes that the prosecutor uses in that case. Any evidence uh, that the defense proffers uh, can be considered. So if you can show that in the last 10 cases, the last 20 or the last 200 cases, the prosecutor has struck a disproportionate number of uh, people of color, uh, that's very powerful evidence uh, that uh, of discrimination and it will boost whatever uh, evidence uh, you can draw from the particular case that's being tried. Uh, so I, 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 would, I would say Foster, is, uh, excuse me, Snyder versus Louisiana, very good case, uh, but uh, you need to have as much evidence as possible because we see the courts just upholding these reasons, no matter how trivial. You know, the, 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 the juror had long hair. You say, what court, you know, out in Arkansas upheld that? No, that was the Supreme Court of the United States uh, that said that striking a black person because he had long, long stringy hair or striking another black person because he had a, a, a goatee 
uh, that those are race neutral reasons. Well, you know, if those are race neutral reasons, then, you know, it makes it fairly easy uh, to articulate a race neutral reason. But look at the white jurors and see if there are all these comparisons that can be made, make it in the, make a record on it. Uh, and, and I think there's a, a chance of, of, survive, of, of prevailing later on. I'd like to build on this thread of advice to criminal defense lawyers. Obviously, this event is hosted by NACL, so we have a lot of defense attorneys, but not only defense attorneys in the audience. But speaking to those defense attorneys, um, I mean, Attorney Woods, you already started off by saying make the Batson challenges. I'm curious if you have other advice, and in, in particular, because you were involved in the push for legislative reform in California, which added a source list, which reformed the Batson test. Do you have any advice um, for lawyers in that context? So I guess two prongs, advice for lawyers in the courtroom litigating and also advice for the defense community in their role as advocates for reform. Um, sure, I think when advice when it comes to Batson in the courtroom litigating, I think you've heard of it. I think one of the most critical pieces um, when it comes to litigating Batson is to be observant and to be a statistician. If possible, have someone in court with you to help you take notes with regards to the jurors. Um, because so much of it is making your record, so much of it is comparison, uh, so much of it is counting and making numbers. Um, I think really being a statistician is critical. Uh, I've seen in the chat there's software to help with this. Um, I'm going to go back and see if I can pull that software up later. Um, but, that, but those things are, I think are really, really critical. And I think make your batching record, make it, make it, make it. I can't stress that enough. Uh, so when it comes to maybe more um, systemic change, I think, um, in my position as a chief defender, I have more latitude and more ways to do it. But but I think one way is, as we mobilize defenders, uh, number one is to be vocal. Um, use your platform, start highlighting the change you want to have, whether it be through social media, whether it be through op-eds or the press. Um, anything that will be helpful to bring your cause to the light um, is what you need to do. If it's not going to be helpful, then shut the hell up. We get legislation passed without any... <laughs> attention on it, be quiet, okay? Um, I think next, uh, collect stories. Um, quick sound bites to highlight your cause. Uh, whether it be like for I said about um, the felony exclusion rule, like over 30% of black men in California cannot serve as jurors. That was a sound bite that caught people's attention. Uh, whether you have examples from cases that a black um, woman attorney in our office who had been trying cases for I want to say eight years had done over 20 trials and could count the number of black jurors on one hand. That, that's a soundbite. Um, had another case where a lawyer um, recently, three out of 112 jurors in Alameda County in Oakland were black. Three, um, three out of 10. I mean, that, that's just a soundbite. And the black client didn't have a single black juror on his case. Now that, that's a soundbite that got people's attention. Um, and you got to have strong partnerships, um, community groups, uh, what is your state public defender organization, um, ACLU, whatever, to really push legislation. And also critical to that is finding the right legislator, uh, finding someone who actually cares, someone who's not just going to carry the bill, this is good for me, um, someone who cares about your cause and will fight on the floor to get it across the finish line. Uh, really, really important. And just to give some examples of what you can do as an office or that we did, um, we've done things like draft the language of the bill, uh, we've written fact sheets for um, senators. We've uh, sending letters of support, um, testifying in front of Senate Public Safety or Appropriations or Judicial Committees. Um, we've written op-eds. Uh, we've had post bars and clerks in our office do 50 state surveys around issues. Um, we've drafted oppositions to bills, um, amendments, and we've appeared in the news. And this, this, there's so much you can do in that space to help get that legislation across the finish line. Uh, and, and finally, on that, um, public defenders. Um, we have a unique view. We see all this injustice that happens in the courts. Like every day we come back at the court and say, did you see that effed up thing that happened? Like, yeah, okay. We see it all the time. And so mobilizing our voice to fix it is critical. You know, we see it. So we almost have an obligation to be there to fix it. And uh, I'm really, I guess, impressed throughout the nation, how defenders are using their voice to help get legislation passed. Professor Bright, I, I actually have something I want to follow up with what you said there, but um, you have, Professor Bright, you have experience working uh, in jurisdictions where realistically attorneys might make a Batson challenge and it's not going to prevail ever 
Do you have advice for defense attorneys in those communities? Well, I do, because I think many people are reluctant to bring bets and challenges because they think it's totally hopeless. Uh, they know that the local judge is never going to grant a bets and challenge in a million years. Uh, and they also uh, know that the prosecutor will not like it if the prosecutor, uh, you know, and sometimes the prosecutor say, you're saying I'm a racist? You're saying I'm a liar? As I said earlier, that, that basically is what the court uh, has to find. Uh, but, you know, Tim Foster's case was an interesting case. The two public defenders in Rome, Georgia, the year after Batson came down, uh, they filed a motion and it said the prosecution in this county always strikes all the blacks. They always have. And they're going to keep doing it. But last year, the Supreme Court of the United States decided a case called Batson versus Kentucky, and you can't do that anymore. So they had a hearing on it before trial and as was pointed out a moment ago, it sort of put the prosecutor on notice that you're going to be challenged. Uh, it was interesting it, during the hearing, there was no question there was going to be a Batson hearing. The prosecution never said, oh, we're going to let blacks on the jury. It was, it was clear that all the blacks would be struck uh, and there'd be a Batson hearing. And there was, they, they struck all, all five uh, and, and there was a hearing. But the fact that that had been preserved many, many, I, 30 years after the trial, uh, that was the only thing we had uh, we were we had lost in the state post conviction. Uh, we were about to go into federal uh, habeas corpus. Uh, Supreme Court granted review in that case uh, and reversed and 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 saved Tim Foster's life. Uh, so uh, you know it's particularly if you're in a death penalty case or a case with a really uh, severe sentence, it's really important uh, to preserve the issue. Uh, and to make the point that uh, the way in which the blood here was conducted, the way in which the uh, people of color were questioned, the side-by-side -side comparisons, that all these factors together, uh, it may be that the trial judge is going to deny it. I mean, Batson's kind of funny. We say we defer to the trial judge because the trial judge is closer. Actually, the Batson, the further away you get, the clearer it becomes. Uh, a lot of times the appellate court looks at it and says, well, you know, of course, 10 for 10 uh, with these ridiculous reasons. Uh, or the Supreme Court of the United States, or uh, the New York Times, whoever it may be. Uh, but uh, these are issues that a lot of times we don't win locally, uh, but, but we do win later on. And we just have to keep litigating these issues and, and keep trying to put as many facts as possible in the record uh, in order to be in a position to, to, to win these cases on appeal or in post-conviction. Thank you. So I was asking about advice for the criminal defense attorneys in the audience, but of course we have prosecutors and court administrators in the audience too. And they're part of the community that is hoping to see some changes made and, and noticing particularly in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement that a lot of courts have issued public statements and started committees that are focused on racial justice. So on the one hand, it could feel like there are more partners for reform and change. Um, and I'm just curious if you have advice for policymakers or prosecutors in the audience um, who are share an interest in improving the system. Obviously, advice prosecutors don't make strikes based on race. Okay, check. But for those who are interested in making broader changes. If, if I, I'm so glad you, you put it that way, Professor um, Turnoff, because I think that's what's so rich about this opportunity that um, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers proposed is that this is an all hands on deck solution system that we need to be creating, right? No truly strong prosecutor whose intent um, is for justice to occur could ever feel good about a win just for their own kind of record. That's not what we're trying to do. That's not why we're electing and selecting prosecutors all over the nation. So I agree with you and I, I see them in my classroom, people who have a heart to use, um, to, to execute justice from the prosecutorial space in the system. Um, I, I'm so grateful for this really rich chat. Uh, Mr. Woods had mentioned it, but that software point, who it got all of my, it made me wanna go looking for my tinfoil hat. That is the area of gravest concern that I have because what we do when we come to this issue related to bias and racism in jury selection, if I could go a little broader and say in the criminal justice system, we start to get to a place to say, maybe it's us, the humans. 
maybe if we just pull away the humans and move in the AI, the technology, which is supposed to be at some point a better version of us, it will go better. And, you know, this is my research. This is the area that's of grave interest to me. Um, I, I just published a piece this year out of Washington and Lee Law Review called Technological Tethers. I watch way too many movies. Us is Fantastic by Jordan Peele. But in this um, in this paper, I start to outline some grave concerns about what I'll call untrustworthy artificial intelligence. I argue that there are three major concerns with using algorithms, software in our legal system. Our quest is to take away the biases of humans. Who has written the code? Humans. Um, where we're at right now with the way that AI works is it's so good it doesn't even need us, right? We basically just give it a few parameters and for instance, in natural language processing, it is able to determine from a sentence and write a whole article. It is able to watch a pen drop and understand the laws of gravity. That's how good this AI is. We also know though, is that DARPA has already, is begging for someone to make AI as smart as an 18 month old. Think about that, right? The artificial intelligence that is making determinations on liberty and justice and freedom is only has the common sense of an 18 month old. And this is a product that we have people using all throughout our legal system throughout the country. I argue that I'm concerned about nefarious actors. We know that from solar winds, right? That the highest levels of the, of the United States federal government were hacked. What's happening in your county with a software product that they got off the shelf? We know that there's faulty data, right? We know that the data is incomplete. We know that the AI is is trying to make sense of incorrect keystrokes. We know there are states like New Mexico that don't even keep racial data, right, in the criminal justice system. So we don't, aren't even able to know if it's really coming up with a good answer. And my third major concern is on rogue AI. This is what's so fascinating with um, GPT-3 for any of those that are looking into that. Some of these new things that the natural language processing and machine learning is doing is it's figuring stuff out that when you put the developer on the stand and say, why did it get to this outcome? The developer says, I don't know. And these are the products that are being used on the shelves. What we've also discovered is that a lot of the stuff is not much better than the humans, lay person coming to similar outcomes of what we're seeing in the courtroom, right? So why are we adding in this product where we could never eat, you know, it's bad enough we've got persons who will tell you that their intent was not racial. How much worse is it for AI that the answer is we don't know? Um, so I'm so sorry that, uh, sorry, my, uh, my tinfoil hat came out. I get always concerned when we put these things in place because of, of grave issues of we really now don't even have a recourse. There's no form for this to say that AI made me do it. And, and that's an area um, that I would encourage defense attorneys, prosecutors, um, people interested in policy reform to say we need a pause and a lot more transparency in the products being used in any part of the criminal justice system. And I think that um, point about needing more transparency about what's happening in the computer programs, just talking about within the jury selection system, is a place where there's room for collaboration because there have, um, and I see that Bonnie Hoffman posted in the chat, linked to an article where I list all the different things that happen by accident in computer programming systems, including a program that read the, in Connecticut, that read the D in Hartford to be to mean deceased. So for a three year period, never selected any jurors from Hartford in the state of Connecticut. And Hartford is the area that has um, the highest concentration of black and Latinx jurors. 60% of the black and Latinx jurors in the state were excluded through that computer programming error. And there are many examples of, pro of inadvertent errors like that that contribute to the diminishment of the pool. And without transparency, without access, we won't find them. But going back down to the stage of jury selection, um, the visible stages, the Batson stages, um, I'm interested in both, if you think there are small I, fixes. I, I, oh, yes. I'm, I'm gonna jump in, because you asked a okay. question that I had not thought about before, okay? And I'm a little bit intrigued by that, about what prosecutors could do. Um, and so I started taking notes. Um, and I think if prosecutors' offices are serious about this issue and really serious about this problem, um, they need to begin to train their prosecutors as an issue. Um, and I don't want to see any more surface implicit bias training or equity training. I want some real anti-racist training. Uh, I want training that shows the harm that can be done by what they're doing with regards to excluding black people from juries. 
uh, I think there's got to be, you got me, you got my brain just firing now. I love this. Um, maybe there needs to be some sort of policies put in place for prosecutors to explain to some sort of supervisor why they've excluded a person of color from the jury. Uh, I'm not sure if we need, like, they've got their conviction integrity units. And um, maybe they need some sort of jury integrity unit. Um, how about they keep stats of every time a prosecutor strikes a person of color? Um, keep for every prosecutor and make them publicly available okay yeah let's get let's, let's add some heat to that um and maybe finally instead of constantly always opposing every single piece of legislation that the defense or aclu or someone puts forward to make our juries more diverse instead of opposing them how about you support them or at least stay neutral okay don't put your money weight and power into opposing it because when you do that, we do not believe you're serious about any sort of change. So um, those are my few suggestions, and I love that question. I'm so glad you called me back. I got, just got excited about the computer problems, <laughs> which is one of my favorite topics. But I'm so glad we got to hear from you on that point. What about you, Professor Bright? Advice for prosecutors or court administrators who are also motivated for reform? Well, my advice to court administrators and my advice for people among things to advocate is to keep statistics. We keep a lot of statistics. Uh, and of course, the clerk of the court of court administrators, they could keep statistics on the use of strikes in every single case, plaintiffs and defendants in, in civil cases, prosecutors and defense lawyers in, in criminal cases. Uh, but if we had that kind of record, I think it'd do two things. I think one, it would be uh, uh, evidence in that some cases. I also think though, uh, if you saw your statistics were so out of line, if the prosecutor's office was using all of its strikes uh, against people of color, and that was documented case after case after case, or using a, a grossly disproportionate, it would probably affect the way uh, strikes were used in, in future cases. Um, I, I know there are some prosecutors, I've talked to one recently, uh, don't use primary strikes. Uh, they'd let the defense use peremptory strikes, but, but they really don't exercise them in the theory that they don't really have uh, a reason to exclude people unless there's just some extraordinary reason that somebody can't be fair uh, so that the community decides the cases. I know that's not going to be real popular, uh, the, um, but it, it, it maybe some people would, would see the merit to that. Uh, the computer programs I've thought of are the ones that uh, you know, tell you that when the prosecution strikes seven out of seven uh, African Americans in, in jury selection, that the odds of that happening by random are whatever they are, uh, and provide a basis for uh, making uh, sort of strengthening the Batson challenge by showing that it really is extraordinary uh, when when something like that happens, as it often does. Can I also add, Professor Chernoff? Um, so, for instance, in New Mexico, we've started the New Mexico Sup Supreme Court Commission on Equity and Justice. I'm one of the steering committee members and also now a sitting member. Um, I think the more states that, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at the course as a whole and something that keeps striking people is there's something we've got to do about criminal justice. We really got to dig in a lot deeper. I'd encourage, um, we've got prosecutors and defense attorneys and professors and and court administrators and even security in the courts all sitting down together to say, what can we do? Professor Bright is absolutely right. We've got a, a data subcommittee that's just asking the question, what is actually happening throughout all of the diverse rural and urban and um, different types of, and, and tribal spaces and all the unique physical spaces in New Mexico, what's happening truly in the legal system. And so I think more data that is gathered, more jurisdictions that are going to just sit down and do this. New York had a, a very thorough, 180 page document about what they discovered about what was happening in their courts with anecdotal and statistically sent, quanti quantitative and qualitative research. So I think that's a great place to start is everyone coming down, sitting at the table together. Great, thank you. I want to make sure that the uh, attendees know you can post questions in the Q&A and I'll um, reach some of those. Um, so we've talked about different alternatives to Batson, one, eliminating peremptory strikes, two, creating a more objective test that um, makes impermissible some of the most commonly used cover stories uh, that we're seeing from Washington and California. 
One another question is about um, legislation that would establish quotas on juries to achieve community racial diversity, so in, imposing the mixed jury requirement. Um, maybe even separate from whether how likely or not you think that is, what do you think are the merits or costs of that kind of approach? Ooh, quotas, that's one of our most unfavorite US legal words, right? We, we've been really trained to think that there's something wrong with saying um, we need a particular number of people. You all may have just noticed what happened, I believe it was North Carolina and their, their university, if I'm not mistaken, um, that just uh, kind of got raised as a factor to be okay by the Supreme Court's there. So um, I am unsure, I'll, I'll give that as a, as a, a fair answer. Um, I don't think we're there yet to, to appreciate that um, because there is this underlying assumption um, that if you are a particular background, you will therefore have a particular way of behaving. And if I could play with this a little bit as it relates to cognitive dissonance, right? It's this, this thing we're buttressing up against of this colorblind constitution, but a color conscious society. And in the US, we can't Put those two things together. It seems to go against us to say that particular numbers of, of certain individuals with a certain phenotype or cultural background will help because we've been told, don't look at it, be colorblind. But we're in a very color conscious society. And I think the criminal justice, um, the voir dire process, the, the jury selection, every part of it involves race so much that to act like it's not true is another big problem. But that's kind of, that was just some of my first thoughts on that. That's an excellent question. I, I, I was I had to put some time in thinking about that. I didn't see that one coming. And I, and I can't recall exactly what it was, but Derek um, Bell had something I think called the Jury Selection Act where he had some formula for, um, and, I, and I can't remember what it is, it was bugging me. Something about um, the, uh, the jury should be 50% of the, um, of the person of color, it was some reflection like that. And I can't remember, but I was thinking it as you posed that question. Uh, I don't think we use a quota for, for example, Alameda County is 12% um, African-American, so that should be a percentage of the jury. I think that would be a wrong quota to use. I think we gotta use a quota like, well, the incarcerated population of, African, of Alameda County is 50% African-American. So let's make sure that the jury is 50% black. Boom, all right, that's gonna, that's gonna be a game changer. Or, um, you know, our jail is 80% people of color right now. Okay, let's make sure the jury's 80% people of color. That, that's, that's a little bit of a game changer right there. Um, I can't remember who I was talking to the other day. It was some jurisdiction where 94% of the people incarcerated are people of color and it just blew my mind. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, so I, I always think if you wanna create some real change in the system, um, if you were able to put in place dynamics like that, you'd create change. You'd create some change. Professor Bright, do you want to speak to that proposal? Well, no, I'd add one thing again for court administrators. For a long time in Georgia, there were so many challenges to the underrepresentation of. Uh, African Americans in the jury pool, they were successful because they were pretty substantial underrepresentation. And finally, uh, the court required that the clerk of court in every capital case uh, certify uh, that the percentage in the population was uh, equal to the percentage in, or the percentage in the jury pool was uh, same as in the population. So 35% of the population was African American and 35% of the jury pool had to be uh, legally, it has to be within about 10%, but the, uh, what, what they did was actually matched it right on. So it was 35, 35. Uh, I, do, I don't imagine the courts there are gonna go much beyond that, uh, but uh, I do think one of the things was said earlier about community education, I do think one important thing with community education is, is saying to NAA chapters and churches and other people, the importance of responding when one is uh, summoned to court uh, because we lose a lot of people uh, in summonses that don't get served. Can't do anything about that really, although there are ways to argue to the court that something ought to be done about that. But people that get the summons and don't come uh, and uh, really people need to understand uh, 
uh, that you know all this struggle for all these years to finally make it possible for people to vote and for people to be on juries, um, you know, if we're going to realize that, uh, people need to show up for, for jury duty. Uh, and I, I know from efforts that have been made in that regard that it can be very successful. I have two thought. Oh, go ahead. Yes, please, please. Yeah, no, I'm so glad Professor Bright said that. So who here has been called for jury duty? That was, um, you know, there's some exciting parts in your live life. I'm getting called for jury duty. I had that opportunity a few years back, at, like Professor Bright said. And I remember him initially saying, oh, I'm so busy, right? Three months, I was called for grand jury duty. You know, not just jury duty, the grand kind. And I remember thinking three months of my time, how am I ever going to find that? And then Eric Garner happened in New York, right? And when I started to piece together this understanding of, oh, it's not, I could have a voice in that moment, right? I think what you're saying, Professor Bright is so very true. And I'm actually gonna get ready to contact some people here in New Mexico, the New Mexico Black Leadership Council and the Office of African-American Affairs to really express the power and the voice and this little, these hard sacrifices and choices left to make about childcare and working so that you can have a voice and use that moment wisely when called for jury duty. That's really powerful, Professor Brighton. I'm glad you said that here. It does raise one point, um, you know, Mr. Woods pointed out the problems with the low pay and how that affects diversity. And in the first session, I asked the speakers, what's one myth about jury selection that you wanted to, you know, disrupt or what's something you wish everyone knew about jury selection. And Paula Hannaford, who's the director of the Center for Jury Studies at the National Center for State Courts, who's here on the chat, um, highlighted research that showed that when controlling for income, the response rate to juror summons does not differ by race. Um, and so it really zeroes the spotlight on the uh, economic, the economic disparities that are you know, due to structural racism that change um, people's ability to respond to the summons. And at the same time, I also wanna lift up the jury project, the juror project that Will Snowden um, has been leading in New Orleans, which I think is the kind of community education pro program um, that you're alluding to and has had some great success. And I bet someone will put that in the chat, yeah. And I also, I also wonder, now that you're raising that, Professor Turnoff, about the impact of jurisdictions that move to virtual. Or there, was, there was some early start, remember, during the pandemic that we've got to get these jury trials back happening. Um, what about virtual? And I think about jurors who are concerned about the global pandemic and even being out in public squares versus those who are like, I don't have steady internet connection in my home. It won't matter if you tell me to log in. So there's a lot of... of the impact of economics of our current legal system to have a, a jury really need to be further studied. One thing that I'm seeing in the chat is a lot of, um, can't completely follow, but it looks like a passionate discussion about the role of defense strikes um, and to the extent that those are motivated by race. And so I don't really have a question. I just put that topic out there to you. What is the, um, what role does the possibility that defense strikes are based on race play in your own analysis of the Batson issue or your ideas for reform? Well, you know, a lot of us, I think, would say uh, that uh, Batson shouldn't apply defense strikes. Uh, that case was argued in the Georgia case, McCollum uh, versus Georgia in the Supreme Court uh, held. Uh, Batson did apply. Batson applies to everybody. It applies in civil cases. It applies to defense. It applies to prosecution. Uh, so uh, if it applies, one has to comply with it. The thing that I find so dismaying about it uh, is that I find these judges who never find a Batson violation when the prosecution strikes a black person uh, seem to find them more frequently when the defense strikes a white person. And my view about it is, you know, white people were never in slavery. Uh, we're never a, a small minority. We're never, you know, it's a whole, uh, haven't had this history of discrimination. Uh, it is a whole different question. Uh, but there's no question that there are courts and, and there are judges. I mentioned the federal case, the, the Walker case in Georgia, where uh, the judge uh, found bats and violations where the defense struck uh, white jurors, even though there were a lot of white jurors. It wasn't like they eliminated them from serving on the jury. Uh, but 
at any rate, the one thing that every lawyer has to know is that it does apply and one better be prepared. And if there are reasons for striking people, better be prepared to articulate those reasons. And of course, if the, if the court does, if a trial judge does grant a strike that it shouldn't grant, uh, the case should be reversed uh, if the appellate court agrees. So there is some risk to the prosecution there in challenging uh, and winning a Batson challenge uh, against the defense lawyer. Thank you. Do either uh, Mr. Woods or Professor Rankin want to respond to that? It's not required, not mandatory questions. Just want to make sure you have the space. I'll give it to Mr. Woods that you get, they're geniuses. I love listening. <laughs> um, I, I, I agree with um, Steve on this one. It, it's, um, it, it's, it, it happens so rarely and infrequently, it's kind of not an issue. And I, 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 I sometimes I get bothered by that question when it comes up. Um, we are in a position where we as defenders are by large proportions defending black and brown people is what we do. And, and they're the ones who are suffering under the weight of the system. And they're the ones who are suffering under the racism that's perpetrated by the system and by prosecutors. And so to flip it that way, it, it doesn't happen. Um, it's almost not worth a discussion point. It's um, it, my, my first thought was um, all lives matter. That, that, that's, what, that's what it sounded like to me a little bit. Um, uh, and, and I'm not trying to be flipped around that question, but it's just, um, it's when the system is constructed in a way that continues to harm black and brown people, um, those perpetrating that harm need to realize what they're doing and it's not the defense. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you so much for each of those responses. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left. So, and I, I need to save the last two minutes for Monica's. I, so I guess my last question is, um, why does this matter so much? Why does it matter so much that we have diverse juries? I think everyone here would say, yes, it matters, but why exactly? Well, you look at the Curtis Flowers case, six capital trials, and every trial where it was an all white jury or a jury of 11 whites and one black, he got the death penalty. Uh, in the two cases where uh, there was a racially diverse jury, uh, the jury couldn't reach a verdict at the guilt phase as to whether he was guilty or not. Uh, that's just a good little example uh, that uh, diversity on juries does make a, quite a difference. It's a powerful example, yeah. If I could just add, you know, it's um, these, these questions, that question always gets a little bit of my um, USA flag, inner flag going, right? You know, that at its core, I, what it's, what the United States proposes to be is a place where you have a chance, right? That you'll have an opportunity to have your day in court. I really love this notion of, of justice, right? That, the, that we are after solutions. Um, and when juries are not diverse, it shows the true crack of what is not really happening in the United States. It's, it's, a, it's a small underpinning, right? We could Right now we're talking about diverse juries, but we could also talk about diverse doctors and we could talk about um, medical facilities and we could talk about schools. We, we could change it to anything. And this idea of diversity, I'll go even farther and, and use terms of equity and inclusion, right? That numbers is not enough. Every black person is not going to decide the same way and on its face to strike every black person really undercuts the reality of how diverse and distinct every black journey is in the nation. It, it is flattening so many people. It flattens so many ideas. Um, sorry, I just saw that comment in the chat. Yes, there are diverse black people even on the United States Supreme Court, right? We are the, one of the most multifaceted people from, that are located all over the diaspora. And they have this idea that a black person will vote or rule a certain way on his face is really showing that real concern about how people feel they don't belong in this country. And so every time someone is working to strike a person on its face, um, just simply because of their visible phenotype, 
is a reminder that we don't belong in this country. We're not valued in this country, that it's all a front. That's part of why diverse stories matter, right? Because every world lived experience should have an opportunity to serve their nation in this kind of way, um, to remind us that we all actually do have membership, shared membership in this society. Um, for, for me, I think that there is um, nothing more disheartening than being a criminal defense attorney and being in a trial uh, with your black client and going through the jury selection process and having not a single black person on that jury. Um, so that person can be incarcerated, they're going back to jail and they're surrounded by black and brown people. But when it comes to someone who's sitting in judgment of them, there's not a single black person to be seen. Um, that that's horrific, it's horrifying, and it feels um, completely disempowering for our clients and defense attorneys. I think that it really harkens back to a time where it's a trial by an all white jury. It feels like more of a public lynching than a fair process. Um, so, so that's reasons why I think, and I think if you look at it, there have been studies, right? There have been studies to show how having diverse juries can impact results. Um, you know, specifically, I think there's a study that showed that having a black person, a single black person in the jury pool, um, black people and white people were convicted at similar rates. And there wasn't a black person, uh, black people were convicted, I believe, at 81% more times and white people 68% more times. Um, it has an outcome um, that brings fairness. You know, racially diverse juries have shown to um, deliberate longer. They discuss more case facts. They raise more questions about what was missing from the trials. They are more likely to discuss race issues. Um, they discuss racial profiling and misconduct. Um, they get into the case deeper. Um, they bring a different analysis. Um, diversity is needed on our juries if you want to get to any sort of justice. So um, th that's my reason with regards to why um, it matters. Thank you all so much. We have been educated and inspired.